today I'm, I'm even more disorganized than usual because I've been running between meetings and just made it, made it time for, for this meeting. But I, I wouldn't miss this one for the world because we have the one and only Robert, Robert Brinkmeyer as, as our guest. And I'm, we have a small but select crowd, but I, I know that we have at least a couple, well, at least three prominent uh, literature scholars here in the audience, and which is really fitting because Bob Brinkmeyer is, of course, a, a one of the best known scholars of Southern literature in the world in existence. And I think you have you have seen his uh, CV or bio in, in the uh, in this announcement for, for this talk. And of course, Bob is currently at the, uh, the University of South Carolina. And then, but before that, I, mean, I don't think you have your. Yeah, don't go okay. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that, of course, I mean, I think you started your <laughs> career at Tulane, and then, then he worked at, 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 at Ole Miss or University of Mississippi. And that's when, when Bob came, first came over to Finland in, back in 1994 95. I got to know him at that time and, and visited him, him over in. At, at all this in, in Mississippi, and and I mean he, he's been coming back for our conferences ever since, and I think he's going to present again at the Maple Leaf and Eagle conference. Mm -hmm. It's coming mm -hmm. May, so we're going to meet Bob again mm -hmm. in, in just six months or so. Mm -hmm. But of course, Bob is a you know he's a well-known scholar of Southern Literature Award, won a lot of awards with, with the uh, what's it the fourth ghost. Stop. Yeah, okay, I, I'll stop. Okay, anyway, he's uh, Bob's uh, specialist in Southern literature, but he's also developed an interest in eco criticisms. And, and of course, this is his topic today because he, he's gonna. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Wendell Berry. I, I know Parker, Parker's probably pretty familiar with his work and Mark also. But anyway, he's, he's gonna give us his ideas about Wendell Berry. But please Thank go ahead. Yeah, I have a, a long connection with Finland, and um, my year here as a bicentennial chair was just wonderful. And I try to come back as often as I can. I got a little bit of, of a cold, so I may be a little loopy. So if you'll just bear with me, particularly if there are questions or answers. What I want to do today is first um, kind of introduce you to Wendell Berry, and then talk a little bit about his politics and his agrarian vision. And I want to start, assuming this works, by showing you the trailer of a film uh, that, that was recently made of Wendell Berry. And in this trailer, Berry is reading a poem, and then there are two striking images. And keep the images in mind as I give my talk, because they, they are relevant. And I, the nice thing about the trailer is you get to hear Barry, Barry's voice. Even when I dreamed, I prayed that what I saw was only fear and no foretelling. For I saw the last known landscape destroyed for the sake of the objective, the soil bulldozed, the rock blasted. Those who had wanted to go home would never get there now. I saw the forest reduced to stumps and gums. I saw the poisoned river, the mountain cast into the valley. I came to the city that nobody recognized because it looked like every other city. Men and women and children now pursued the objective as if nobody ever had pursued it before. The once enslaved, the once oppressed were now free to sell themselves to the highest bidder and to enter the best paying prisons in pursuit of the objective, which was the destruction of all enemies, which was the destruction of all obstacles, which was to clear the way to victory, which was to clear the way to self-creation, from which nobody who ever wanted to go home would ever get there now. For every remembered place had been displaced, every love unloved, every vow unsworn, to make way for the passage of the crown, 
of the individuated, the autonomous, the self-actuated, the homeless, with their many eyes opened only toward the objective, which they did not yet perceive in the far distance, having never known where they were going, having never known where they came from. I'm sorry that I hope you could hear enough of, of, of what was being said. Um, but if not, at least you got an idea of some of the images. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, thank you. So in the first few pages, first few minutes of my talk, I want to kind of give an overview of Barry and then get more specific about his politics. Um, and I'm going to sit and read, and if, if you want me, if I say anything that you want me to stop and discuss, you can, you can just tell me. Since the 1960s, Wendell Berry has been one of America's most strident proponents of traditional farming and communities, as well as one of its most strident critics of the destruction of land, resources, and communities by forces of industrialism and big government. Barry has written close to 50 books, including cultural criticism, fiction, and poetry, all of which is shaped by his agrarian vision, a vision based on traditional work and skills, traditional communities, and traditional knowledge passed down through generations. A recent commentator on Barry's criticism has called it a blend of political radicalism and ecological holism suggesting rightfully that his agrarianism is very diff difficult to classify. It's an unusual mix of conservatism and radicalism. In much of his work, Barry emphasizes the importance of place, and particularly the importance of establishing oneself in a specific place. There's an old Southern saying that Barry no doubt would endorse. You don't know who you are unless you know where you are. In this, Barry stands apart from the vision of radical individualism and mobility that undergirds much of American cultural mythology and ideology, a vision of America and Americans conquering ever new frontiers, of moving endlessly forward into the future, of not worrying about history and whatever destruction in terms of land, people, and community is left behind in the in the perpetual, perpetual quest for the new. Perhaps Barry's most important text in terms of influence is The Unsettling of America, cultural, Culture and Agriculture. In this work, as the title suggests, Barry critiques the American cultural mythology that I've just mentioned. As <clears throat> Barry believes it is better to configure American history, not as a process of settlement, but as one of unsettlement. And I'm going to read you Barry's first, the opening paragraph, because it gives you a sense of what, where Barry is going with his argument. One of the peculiar, peculiarities of the white race's presence in America is how little intention has been applied to it. As a people, Wherever we have been, we have never really intended to be there. The continent is said to have been discovered by an Italian who was on his way to India. The earliest explorers were looking for gold, which was, after an early streak of luck in Mexico, always somewhere further on. Conquests and founding were incidental to this search, which did not and could not end until the continent was finally laid open in an orgy of gold-seeking in the middle of the 19th century. Once the unknown of geography was mapped, the industrial marketplace became the new frontier. 
and we continued with largely the same motives and with increasing haste and anxiety to displace ourselves, no longer with any unity of direction, like a migrant flock, but like the refugees from a broken anthill. In our own time, we have invaded foreign lands and the moon with the high-toned patriotism, patriotism of the conquistadors and with the same mixture of fantasy and avarice. In sketching his history of America, Barry draws heavily and admiringly from Bernard de Boto's mag magisterial history of westward expansion, the course of empire, particularly his analysis on the destruction of Native American cultures, not just by war, but also by trade. De Voto argues that North American cultures, Native American cultures, were immediately doomed when they began trading with white settlers. The introduction of manufactured goods into Native American culture, DeVoto says, initiated cataclysmic changes into Native American folkways, values, and beliefs, setting the stage for cultural collapse. This is DeVoto. The first belt knife given by a European to an Indian to an Indian was a portent as great as the cloud that mushroomed over Hiroshima. adding that as Native American societies became progressively integrated into the commercial system, quote, a culture was forced to change much faster than change could, could be adjusted to. All corruptions of culture produce breakdowns of morale, of communal integrity, and of personality. And this force was as strong as any other in the white man's subjugation of the red man. Barry adds it, quote, Commercial conquest is far more thorough and final than military defeat. The Indian was doomed not by loss in battle, but by accepting a dependence on traders that made necessities of industrial goods. This is not merely history, it is parable. As Barry makes clear, the parable of which he speaks is a later unsettling of America. The invasion of industrialism into America's heartland in the 20th century, unleashing forces that have now for generations been destroying traditions and structures of rural and small town America. Following the lead of the Nashville Agrarians, who in 1930 made a similar argument in their important book, I'll Take My Stand, The South and the Agrarian Tradition, Barry interprets modern industrialism as a manifestation of the pioneering spirit reckless and destructive in the endless pursuit of conquest. Industrialism is a contemporary form of pioneering, writes John Crow Ransom, one of the agrarians. Yet since it never consents to define its goal, it is pioneering on principle and with accelerating speed. As Barry discusses throughout his essays, industrialism destroys the bonds knitting together in traditional communities. Very frequently describes a healthy community as an ecosystem. Quote, the web of relationships by which a place and its creatures sustain a mutual life, which ultimately is mysterious, like life itself. In contrast, the scientific industrial culture disdains material reality and treats the living world, quote, as dead matter, the worth of which is determined exclusively by the market. What Barry means by disdain from material reality is the willingness of industrial powers to, quote, to destroy anything, any place, or anybody standing in its way. Or put more specifically, using examples from Barry, as you, you can see from the trailer, to strip mine mountains, cut down forests, pollute rivers with poisons, and transform small family-run farms into industrialized farming relying upon ever-increasing debt, petrochemicals, and huge farm machinery. Very often uses another metaphor to describe the destruction wrought by industrialism, something that was also suggested in the trailer. That is the war. This is Barry. We have established an analogy between land use and war, Barry writes, adding that, quote, the common theme is a terrible pragmatism that grants an absolute predominance of the end over the means, in oblivion or defiance of any natural or moral law 
that may stand in the way. In the industrial land economies, from agriculture to mining, anything coming from the land that cannot be sold is treated as an enemy, and this includes natural and human communities. There are kinds of violence, Barry writes, that have nothing directly to do with unofficial or official warfare, but are accepted as normal to economic life. Toxic pollution, land destruction, destruction of biological diversity. Extending his analogy, Barry, Barry characterizes the conflict between industrialism and rural America as America's cold civil war. With this brief overview, I want to turn to a topic in Barry's work that is related to the idea of war. In terms of both the domestic Cold War Barry sees taking place in America and America's international war on terrorism. The two wars, as I hope to show, are for Barry integrally related, in part because Barry sees the federal government as an agent of industrialism. Both the war on terror and the war in the nation's ecosystem raises issues not only of freedom and democracy, but also of the future of the world. I'll start with the war on terror. In several essays from Barry's collection entitled Citizenship Papers, he discusses global terrorism, focusing less on the threats posed to America by the terrorist violence than on those posed to the U.S than those posed by the U.S. government's declared war on terror. In his essay, The Failure of War, which was written not long after the 9-11 attacks, Barry challenges those advocating an all-out war on terrorism by asking them to consider that, quote, the cost even of, of a successful war of national defense in life, money, material goods, health, and inevitably freedom may amount to a national defeat. National defense in war, he continues, always involves some de degree of national defeat. The paradox has been with us from the very beginning of the, Repu of the Republic. Militarization and defense of freedom reduces the freedom of the defenders. There is a fundamental inconsistency between war and freedom. In another essay from the collection, Barry discusses how America's newly implemented security measures undermine the fundamental workings of its democratic government, most notably by granting the president full power without any consent of the govern, government of the governed to initiate preemptive war. As a policy, Barry observes, this, is, this new strategy depends less on the depends on the acquiescence of the public kept fearful and ignorant subject to manipulation by the executive power and on the compliance of an intimidated and office-dependent legislature. To confront the terrorist threat, Barry advocates a different policy, one based on what he calls peaceability, a term that he knew would open him to strident criticism for what would be perceived as liberal softness against America's enemies. Anticipating this criticism, Barry stresses that peaceability has anything to do, is anything but passive, even if it does not advocate a violent response. Authentic peace is no more passive than war, Barry observes. Like war, it calls for discipline and strength of character, though it calls also for higher principles and aims. If we are serious about peace, then we must work for it ardently seriously and bravely as we have ever prepared for war. Central to peaceability is understanding how dangerous and self-defeating is the government's claim that the war on terror would, quote, rid the world of evil. Such reductive thinking, collapsing the complexity of cultural politics to an us versus them binary, precludes self-criticism, as well as any effort to understand the causes that led to people becoming terrorists. Patriotism is another cornerstone, but is not patriotism as generally understood. Barry's patriotism is grounded not in the nation, the politics of nationalism he observes, and we can certainly see this in today's world, 
He's most apt to be fanatic or brutal or arrogant. But instead, it is grounded in one's home and local community. And this is, this is very important for, for Barry. Patriotism it has nothing to do with the nation. It has to do with your local community. This is Barry again. I love this quote. My devotion thins as it widens. I care more for my household than for the town of Port Royal. This is where he lives. More for the town of Port Royal than for the county of Henry. More for the county of Henry than for the state of Kentucky. More for the state of Kentucky than for the United States of America. And here's the kicker. But, but I do not care more for the United States of America than for the world. Barry's final comment that he does not care more for the U.S. than the world points to his simultaneous commitment to the ecosystems of the world at large and to the local community rather than to nation, to the nation and na national politics. Barry's thinking, of course, runs counter to a world shaped by nationalism and globalism like we're in today. Increasingly, Americans, including notoriously their politicians, are not from anywhere, Barry observes. They might have an abstractly conceived homeland, as in America's Department of Homeland Security, but, quote, no home place that they are strongly moved to know or love or use well or protect. All this does not mean that Barry, that Barry ignores national and global politics, but it does mean that he believes one politics begins with one's everyday life. As the title of one of his collections of essays, Home Economics, suggests, this is very funny, in, in the United States, when I was growing up, girls, when they were in junior high, took home economics. They learned how to cook and sew, and, and boys took shop. They learned how to use saws. So when I saw this title, Home Economics, I, this was one of the last collections of berries I ever read because, I, because of my early associations. But for Barry, the idea of home economics is important suggests that resisting forces of economic industrialism starts by creating sustainable economies in the home and in the community. Barry observes that, quote, anyone who wants to do so can begin it in himself and in his household as soon as he is ready. By becoming answerable to at least some of his own needs, by acquiring skills and tools, by learning what his real needs are, by refusing the glamorous and the frivolous. When a, when a person learns to act on his own best, excuse me, when a person learns to act on his own best hopes, he enfranchises and, and, validate, and validates them as no government or policy ever will. And by this action, the possibility that other people will do the same is a likelihood. The title of an es another essay from this collection, Discipline and Hope, suggests that one's ethics and values, wherein lies one hope, are rooted in everyday practice. These values, Barry argues, cannot be sacrificed to the demands of the, the state, since, to quote, to assert that a man owes an allegiance that is antecedent to his household, or higher than his allegiance to the earth, meaning the land, is to invite a state of moral chaos that will destroy both the household and the earth. Peaceability and national defense, extending Barry's analysis, are likewise facing our focus like squarely on the local. While Barry often talks about food security when speaking about national defense, his analysis that his analysis of the significance of small town communities in defending the nation extends far beyond the matters of food production. For Barry, small town communities are the core of American identity and of belief. 
The affection for our land and neighbors, he says, are the heart of what he calls true patriotism, the, necessar the true patriotism necessary for the defense of the nation. In its most fundamental sense, Barry writes, patriotism requires this of the nation. Its citizens must love their land with a knowing, intelligent, sustaining, and protective love. They must not, at any price, destroy its beauty, its health, or its productivity. And they must not allow their patriotism to be degraded by mere loyalty to symbols or any present set of officials. Small towns are a sound national defense, Barry writes. They defend the country daily and hourly in all their acts of taking care of it by causing it to thrive, by giving it health and the satisfaction that make it worth defending, and by teaching these things to the young. The idea that small town rural people committed to their home place might be the backbone of America is not unique to Barry, but few if any writers push it as hard as he does. It is indeed one of his most radical stances, particularly given the long-standing and widespread widespread cultural bias in the U.S. against farmers and rural people. The countryside's centrality to Barry's cultural criticism, as well as his fiction, lies in the fact that Barry, Barry repeatedly presents, as I've already noted, America constantly at war, not in conflict with external enemies, though of course that happens and seems to be with the war on terror unending, but internally between the forces of industrialism and the forces of small town and rural traditions, Barry's cold civil war. The watershed moment for Barry in this domestic war was the conclusion of World War II, when wartime technologies were retooled for farming and industry, with agriculture over time being destroyed by corporate agribusiness. Agriculture would become an industry, Barry writes, Farms would become factories like other factories, ever more automated and remotely controlled. Industrial land use has thus become a front in a war against the, a li the living world. So apocalyptic were the consequences of this destruction that Barry, and this is an unfair, this is an unfair co uh, comparison, but I see the point he's trying to make. Barry compared the demise of rural life in America with the Nazis and annihilation of Polish, of Poland's Jewish communities during World War II. <clears throat> this is Barry. Rural American uh, communities, economies, and ways of life that in 1945 were thriving, and though imperfect, full of promise for an authentic human settlement of our land, are now as effectively destroyed as the Jewish communities in, of Poland. The means of destruction were not blatantly so evil but they have proved just as thorough. How would you describe the difference between modern warfare and modern industry, Barry asks. Between, say, strip mining or between chemical warfare and chemical manufacturing. The difference only seems to be that in war, the victimization of humans is directly intentional. And in industry, it is accepted as a trade-off. After noting that farmers in the U.S. have about the same status as enemy civilians in wartime, he characterizes corporate thinking towards rural people. They are objects of humane consideration, but if they are damaged or destroyed collaterally, then we very much regret it that they were in our way. Barry's observation here points to another consequence that he sees working in this domestic civil war. The corporations and the federal government working together have colonized the rural countryside. It's an irony especially bitter for Americans, Barry writes, that having cast off the colonialism of England, we have proceeded to impose a domestic colonialism on our own land and people. And yet we cannot deny that most of the money made on the products that we produce in rural America is made by other people in other places. 
The internal colonization undermines rural communities by destroying the principle of local self-sufficiency, not only in the local economy, but in the local culture, and even worse, in terms of long-term effects. The market forces driving food production and resource extraction destroy the land and its resources, with no concern given to sustainability. The ecosystem, including the place of humans within that system, is being devastated, disrupted, polluted, poisoned. Colonization brings us back to the Civil War, the Fairies Cold Civil War. We are involved unrem unremittingly in a war, not against foreign enemies, but against the world, meaning the land, both local and global against our freedom, and indeed, against our existence. In contrast to his essays, in which Barry speaks with the stridency of an Old Testament prophet, Barry's fiction is more nuanced and quiet, focused on the everyday life of his fictional town, Fort William, Kentucky. All of his fiction takes place in, in this one small fictional community. Most of his fiction, and this is particularly true of his novels, is narrated retrospectively by one of Fort William's characters, usually late in life and usually from a time late in the 20th century. Through memories of the narrators and through stories told to them, a view of the community's long history evolves, a history stretching back to the Civil War and extending roughly to the present day. Not surprisingly, the port, the period of Port Williams history that gets the most attention are the years following World War II, including the years immediately preceding it and those coming immediately after it. Much of the larger issues central to Barry's fiction, such as the rise of global capitalism and industrial farming, circulate throughout the fiction, though rarely directly presented and commented upon. Working in the background and pressuring the community and its life, these outside forces provide a social and historical context to the changes transforming Port William and the struggle of its rural people to maintain their livelihoods and dignity. One sees through these struggles, and particularly those arising in the mid-20th century, Port William's traditional folkways unraveling beset by internal problems as well as external pressures. As one of Barry's characters comments on the community's slow unraveling, I love this quote, once a fabric is torn, it is apt to keep tearing. The community was coming apart, the old integrity. But it is also in these struggles that one sees Barry forthrightly portraying his true patriotism the loyalties that are grounded foremost in the local, and that in Barry's eyes, as we've seen, are the backbone of the nation's democracy. In his fiction, he calls such patriotism membership, or at times more specifically, the Port William membership. Membership, as defined by Hannah Coulter, one of Barry's most memorable characters, is quite simply people helping each other. There are no formal rules, no bookkeeping, no membership card. cards. Membership is an understanding among people who live in the same community that they all are in this together. They are not competitors of, but they are not competitors with, but supporters of each other. That however much members might pride their individuality, they realize that more importantly, they are part of a community that depends on them and that is shaped by them. Membership might at times restrain, but more importantly, it nurtures. The most obvious sign that membership is healthy in Barry's works, and it is certainly not always that, is that when farmers share their work, helping each other when needed, asking for nothing in return, knowing full well that the membership will be there for them when they are needed. Bonds in the membership are at times even stronger than those within families. 
in various fiction to be talented at one's vocation, vocation is an important word, as opposed to one's job, or as one of various, various characters says derisively, one's employment takes the knowledge of generations, skills passed down from one generation to the next. So too with knowing a place. It takes years. Maybe it takes longer than a lifetime, one of various characters observes, to know a place, especially if you are getting to know it as a place to live and work, and you are getting to know it by living and working in it. And so too in knowing fully about the dynamics of membership, as membership extends to everyone who has ever lived in a place, going back, as a character observes, beyond the time when all the names were forgotten. It is this triple grounding in place, in membership, in local history, that is the foundation of various conceptions of citizenship. It is this, in his discussion of political, of various political vision, Stanley Hauerwaus draws upon the ideas of Sheldon Wolin to argue that there are two ways of understanding the dynamics of government. One, a politics of intending. The other, a politics of tending. Politics of intending locates power in a central administration of experts who determine and oversee what they intend as the most efficient and rational means of order, ordering a society. In contrast, a politics of tending is what we do when we look after one another, as in tending the sick or the garden. This is how it works. Tending requires active care of things close at hand. To tend is to care for objects whose very being requires that they are treated as historical and biographical beings. Such a politics requires the existence of a political culture comprised of shared beliefs, habits, practices, and memories that define the particularity of a place and determine how the future will be negotiated. In such a setting, politics is best understood not as something practiced separate, as something practiced separate from the ordinary, but as a form of cultivation, analogous to attending the fields or flocks. Hauerwas, of course, sees Barry embracing a politics of tending and rejecting a politics of intending. The opposition between these two systems in Barry's work lies behind a comment from one of his characters concerning the young adults who have moved away from Port William. They've left the membership. They've gone over from the world of membership to the world of organization. At its extreme, the politics of tending morphs into a politics of war. One nation, or one political party, or one corporation, whatever, in conflict with some other entity to get what it intends. The conflict often initiated and controlled by experts, experts sitting safely far, far away from the damage they are wreaking. In one of Barry's stories describing the horrors of World War II, a character recalls basic battlefield strategy. You and your people intended to go your way, if you could, and you wanted to stop the other people from going their way, if you could. And whatever interfered, you destroyed. You had nothing on your mind that you wanted or wanted to get to, and anything at all that stood in your way, you had the right to destroy. And if it and it was what in the way, if what in the way were women and children, you would not even know that, and it was all the same. When your power is a big gun, you don't have any small intentions. Whatever you want to hit, you want to make dust out of it. Farm buildings, old towns things that people had made well and cared for a long time, you made nothing of. We blew them apart and scattered the pieces so they couldn't be put together again. And people, too. We blew them apart and scattered the pieces. With only a few tweaks of words, this passage might also be read 
as a manifesto for the world's most widespread and all-consuming power that enforces the politics of intending, industrial capitalism, which Barry notes in one of his essay breeds a commerce of violence that, quote, will destroy anything, any place, or anybody standing between it and whatever it believes it is destined to have. The other extreme of politics of tending morphs into a passionate commitment to permanence, permanence, simplicity, and peace. If one disagrees with the nomadism and violence of our society, Barry writes, then one is under an obligation to take up some permanent dwelling place and cultivate the possibility of peace in it. If one deplores the destructiveness and wastefulness of the economy, then one is under an obligation to live as far out on the margin of the economy as one is able, to be economically independent of exploitive industries, to learn to live, to learn to need less, to waste less, to make things last, to give up meaningless luxuries. As Barry suggests here, and as we've already seen, the best protest against an economics and politics of war is to live in protest, that is to change one daily's life. To make a better world, we must make ourselves better people, Barry comments. In promoting the cause of public peace, we should not neglect the equally difficult task of making ourselves peaceable. Barry's fiction provides numerous examples of characters who have suffered extreme injuries, physical and or psychological inflicted by a system of war and violence, who are now grappling to find a way to live with purpose and meaning. Those who succeed typically move along a path that leads to Barry's ideas of membership. In the novel Remembering, Andy Catlett, a farmer who was beset by corrosive selfishness and skepticism, is now trafficking in a world dominated by corporations and academics who are under their sway. Barry is very suspicious of academics, particularly agronomists. The, who, I don't know if this is the same way in Finland, but schools of agriculture are frequently funded by corporations. So their research is geared towards corporate intentions. While terrified he will eventually collaborate Willy-nilly with the dominance of human intention in the world, Andy Catlett eventually regrounds himself in Port William. On his return trip from San Francisco, Andy Chasen achieves a vision of origins and membership which stretches deep into Port William's history. Now they are coming to him again, those who have brought him here and who remain, not in memory, but near to memory, in the place itself and in his flesh, ready always to be remembered. As suggested here, as well as in the novel's title, rem recalling one's history, as well, recalling one's own history, as well as the history of one place, remembering is crucial for remembering, remembering yourself into the membership. As I've noted for Barry, a person's fundamental responsibilities and loyalties begin at home and spread outward in place and backward in time, reaching out to the living and to the dead and to the ecosystem in, one which lives, in which one lives, to everything and to everybody that has shaped one's identity and the history of one's home community. There can be places in this world and in human hearts too that are opposite of war, says Hannah Coulter, who has watched her husband Nathan slowly recover from the scars he brought home from World War II. To heal himself, Nathan eventually embraces a life of tending, nurturing his marriage and his children, devoting himself to restoring a farm long in disuse. Hannah doesn't use the word peaceability, though she could have. She instead says that Nathan works to create a world kindly kept, 
an apt description of what Barry sees as, fa as a foundation of patriotism, commitment to home, community, and place. An unrealistic vision in today's dark world of, world of violence and mayhem, perhaps, perhaps not. But Barry is far from alone in his focus on small acts of kindness, sharing a vision with a writer rarely linked with him, Cormac McCarthy. What I need most to learn is charity, says one of McCarthy's characters, voices a piercing hopefulness in the face of a dark and forbidding world. I know that small acts of valor, he continues, may be all that is visible of great moments, great movements of courage within. Small acts of valor, of peaceability, are the acts of Barry's heroes, those who keep their humanity alive and pass that humanity along to the membership that includes us all. That for Barry is patriotism. That for Barry is true peaceability. Thank you. I hope I didn't go off too long. Oh, that's, that's fine. We have